Sounds good. Hey guys, it's Phil. Um, I'm going to be giving a class on like an intro to scraping. Um, did you guys see the repo? Um, I don't know if we shared it in the Slack channel, um, but I've got some exercises, uh, not, not like uh, a bunch of exercises to do, um, some practice work for scraping that can make um, the experience maybe a little bit better. I'm going to share my screen real quick. You guys see that? This is what the the repo would look like. Um, so it's kind of going over, uh, you know, what I'm trying to hit today is exposing you guys kind of to just a bunch of different technologies. That's, uh, I know it seems like a lot. It is a lot. We're, we're talking about uh, request, beautiful soup, Jupiter and pandas. Um, those are all different libraries. So you got to pip install all of those. Um, that being said, you don't need all this stuff. Um, but I think the exposure and uh, kind of like live coding through a lot of it um, is helpful because then, you know, I'm probably going to run into a lot of issues today. So, um, but I know you guys will be patient. So um, it, that'll be good for both of us. Um, but we're basically going to try and think about why you would even want to scrape in the first place. I know Tim had just mentioned that uh, he said he's scraping at work. Do you got a, uh, can you talk about that at all, Tim, or what, what how is scraping helpful um, for something that you're doing? Yeah, for work we have, um, it's all based on research papers and uh, we're extracting text from PDF and then we're doing AI summarization on that. Yeah. And all of those research papers aren't stored locally. They're all in the, the university's repository. So I have to go to a URL, find a download link, and then I'm just storing that in memory to do the, the extraction algorithm and the summarization. And then I'm storing that in a, in a blob or a bucket. Nice. Nice. It sounds, sounds complicated, but also very neat. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the things I wanted to, you know, bring up. We're going to look at some examples like starting off that, uh, are pretty easy to get the things that we're after. Um, I guess going back to it, like, Scraping at like a basic level is trying to collect some data um, that's usually within HTML and you're trying to um, get that data and usually transform it or or put it somewhere else, your application, um, your database. Um, it could be a lot of other things, um, but there's something on the web that you want and scraping is a way that you can get it. Um, that being said, there's there is terms of agreement and stuff. So um, if you are practicing some scraping, uh, pay attention to sites that have stuff. If they say they don't want you taking their data, um, you are probably not going to outsmart them as the junior developer to get their data and not get in trouble. Um, but either way, I can't recommend it. Uh, <laughs> um, so how can we scrape, basically? Um, Tim mentioned beautiful soup. That's a good reason why I'm introducing requests and beautiful soup um we've already used requests right where have you guys someone tell me where we've used requests for django yeah just at all the uh, we we actually used it a little bit before django because if you think about it in django we usually Oh, well, it, we can. I guess we have done probably some exercises, but um, Django has a, its own class that can help us with requests, right? Um, but the um, the request library, let me pull up that documentation. There's a bunch of the links. So it's this set of docs. Does it? This page look familiar to everyone else? As we, we probably talked about it maybe around the time we were um, going over APIs and JavaScript and Python. Um, but anyways, it's a handy library for um, Python that lets us um, 
you know, have a simple way to deal with HTTP um, requests. Um, now, the other thing, um, Beautiful Soup, I guess I kind of spoiled, but we'll take a look at that here in a second. Let me just pull it up. Okay, so Beautiful Soup, um, it's basically a Python library that lets us take HTML. So if you're thinking of it as a document, as a file, um, and you know something you could read and write just like anything else, um, Beautiful Soup is something geared towards reading HTML and finding uh, data within it. And so we've all seen HTML. It's pretty nasty to to the eyes with all the angle brackets and uh, other billions of things that can be included in classes. Um, if you're just, you know, reading a whole document, um, you know, the, the index HTML of some big app or something like that, you know, it's not very pretty to look at. And um, it's useful to have something that can filter this down. Um, if any of you guys are going to try and follow along, um, I think the the first website that we're going to use is going to be pretty, pretty easy to get um, started with. Should just be HTTP uh, double slash and then quotes dot to scrape dot com, and we don't have to worry about um, this is this this website was built for for practicing scraping and teaching and education, um, but it'll give us a good idea. This could be any site like. Um, you know, maybe this is data about cars. Maybe this is, um, information about, you know, uh, trending, trending, uh, stock prices or something like that. Um, but we have here a bunch of data that's collected and then, um, pages essentially. And we'll probably get into that a little bit later, but let's get into the scraping, I guess. Um, been talking a lot about it. Does anybody know how it's done or or what side so we're going to use beautiful soup and request? How's that helpful? Okay, that's fine. I'm going to, uh, this is the wrong, we're going to open up some, some code and just get started real quick. Let's do Nectar, Foxtrot, uh, building exercise. We need to make a Vim. And then we said we were going to install uh, requests. Ooh, I, need, I didn't activate my Vim, and I got a nice little warning there. So let's go back and activate my Vim and then install requests. And then it'll be beautiful uh, soup four if I can type. And then we need to make some kind of file and we'll just open that up. So now we can import requests. We can do from BS4 import beautiful soup. And so these are the, the two things that we're going to need. And then we're going to just create a variable for our uh, URL that we're trying to scrape. So we'll do uh, target HTML page is equal to, and then uh, do requests.get, and then our link quotes.toscrape.com. Okay. And then let's see what happens if we just print this. So we'll run our code with Python main UI. 
Okay, that's interesting. We got something, um, a response, response 200. Um, but we were actually hoping to get some HTML. Um, now, if we go to the um, docs that we were just at, sorry, I'm trying to manage the multiple tabs here. We'll go back to the request docs. We can look through at response content and kind of look through some of the options that we have. Um, we're not going to go through, you know, all of how to use beautiful soup, all of how to use requests, all of how to use pandas, all of how to use Jupyter. Um, that would be kind of a lot. And that is, uh, the point is that there's going to be some things from these, um, libraries that we're using that we only need a little bit of, and we, when we don't really need you know, a lot of expertise. So there's, there's some tasks that you'll do over and over again and pick up and build on those skills more and other ones will just kind of come over time. But that's why the, the documentation is included. Um, but it looks like we can get some binary response content with, uh, we use dot content. And then we also, um, could possibly get some text by just using dot text. Um, now, if we go back to our terminal, we could actually run uh, dir on this, if anybody remembers that method, but it will tell us, you know, what this uh, response object has uh, access to. And so we can see a lot of these look like Python things, um, but here we have text. Um, and then I'm sure content is in here somewhere as well. Um, but anyways, taking a little bit of time on this, but there's a lot of ways to run into um, some complications because the reason I wanted to show you that is, you know, sometimes text may work. Maybe you, you can read the docs to figure out, you know, why and more, but in some cases you may want to or need to use uh, doc content. So we'll run this again now that we're targeting the dot text of that response object. And now this, this looks like some HTML that we've seen before or something that we're familiar with. Um, and so now that we've got a whole bunch of HTML, this is what beautiful soup is very helpful for. So if we, now we can create an instance. That's what we we'll typically do with beautiful soup is we'll create an instance and then we'll pass into that instance, um, the HTML content that we are trying to <clears throat> parse, which we just verified was, you know, target HTML dot page or page dot text. And then we want to use the HTML dot parser and then we print this, we're not, we just have our instance of soup here. Um, we still will actually see all of the um, HTML when we run this. Um, but this is actually just our setup to start scraping. Um, because now that we have a um, an instance of soup, we have access to all of soup's um, attributes and methods. And so some of that, it's like, let's look at our page. Sorry, the zoom is in the way. Can move this bar. All right. Okay. Um, so if we look at this page and we inspect in the DOM um, and open up this head and body and all these divs, um, you'll notice that it looks a lot like the HTML we got back from requests. Um, one little trick is you can usually hit inspect on the actual element. And sometimes if it doesn't target it, you can, um, right click again. Um, but we're trying to, as an exercise, basically see if we can get all of the, all of the quotes off of this page. 
So we can see here that this quote is in, looks like a span and it has a class text. And we'll just want to check, but we inspect another one and it looks like this one also is a span and a class text. And so this will be part of your, your research on deciding on whether scraping is helpful for you or not is let's go to the beautiful soup documentation for a second. And we'll go to, you know, searching the tree and we'll go over some of these in just a second, but I just want to point out that, you know, these are some of the methods that we're getting access to in beautiful soup. So there's, there's a find all method that filters, um, a bunch of elements. There's, um, You can get uh, a class by its CSS class. You can use an XPath. Um, there's a lot of different options for targeting a specific element. And so as far as which one's the best or what's the best practice, I would have to say, it, like it, especially for scraping, you're trying to get some data that you want. Um, how efficient it is to get the data is probably uh, doesn't matter that much. Um, but uh, that being said, if you can write cleaner code and and nicer um, code, it's just not something I would worry about too much while you're trying to figure out how to scrape. Um, so let's look at how we can get that. Um, so if we do quotes and then use soup dot find all and find all, we're gonna ask it to let's find all the spans and we're looking for spans that have the attributes of uh, class and text. And so now if I print quotes, It looks like we've got a bunch of spans um, with text. And so now we can do something like um, for quote and quotes, print quote.text. And if we run this again, Now we have all of the all of the quotes off of the page. And so there's a similar setup for this exercise. You know, um, you should be able to find a way to um, inspect and figure out how to target this small tag that has a class author. And then by doing that, you'd be able to also collect all of the authors on a page. Um, and uh, some of what you want to look at in the DOM structure, we'll talk about it a little bit more in the next example, is um, how the elements are laid out and how you would target them if there wasn't a good way to target them. I keep saying um, not a good way. What do you guys think? I mean, when it's hard to target an element. Maybe when everything is a, a div that could give you complications. Yeah, maybe there's no real good unique identifier for me, right? I can't find an ID. I can't really, um, you know, yeah, it's a div, but there's a bunch of other divs and um, they all have similar class names too. So there's nothing I can, I can use. And so um one thing, uh, we'll see if this actually prints out because I, I don't want to print it out in something else, but we could take, oops, we could take, uh, when we inspect something, you can also right click it in the DOM and um, you can go over to copy. And if we copy this, I'm just going to pull up some notes uh, or a scratch pad, sorry. So 
that's the X path or the full X path to whatever I clicked on and inspected. And so if we if we look at an X path, it 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 has to do with the document model. If you're looking up here at HTML, that is your um, exclamation point and doc type like exclamation, and then you have your body and so on and so on, but it's the actual structure path of the DOM. So you can utilize that as a way to target elements as well. And uh, XPath works similar to regex in the sense that you can provide like a relative XPath, um, which is you're basically trying to say, I'm, I'm searching for a div that maybe has this text within its tag. Um, a lot of that stuff gets complicated. It, just like reg regex, I, I would say there's cheat sheets. There's other things that you can look at to um, basically try and get um, familiar with it. But it's just another option. So when you have a very easy way of identifying a class and an element, then you probably should just go for that um, solution, if that makes sense. I'm going to actually shift so that that'll be like if if anybody is interested in doing the stretch um you know assignments for for that it would be to mess around with that site see if you can scrape and make um make some kind of uh i i put a bunch of things on the sorry let's see what do we what did i ask for basically uh yeah i thought that was an interesting one um figuring out what author has the most quotes from the first 10 pages um so the the like step up from scraping would be crawling and it you know has a similar idea where we make one request and we grab everything on this page but you know this one fortunately if we look um oops these these pages when i click next the are pretty predictable it's like i know that the next one will probably be four and it seems to keep the same pattern so with with doing something like that there's nothing to stop you from writing you know a while loop or a for loop and making a systematic way to get data off of lots of pages um in one go essentially and then let's see Sorry, I'm just going to switch back. And so we're going to try scraping from uh, a different site. And we're going to basically build a movie API really quickly. So we're going to have to change our URL to be uh, HTTPS. And it'll be www.imdb.com slash chart slash top okay and then got html content it's going to be equal to requests dot get url we'll clear this Oh, we're not printing. So the first thing I typically do is try and see we have a site that we want to go to and get some data. And look at that, we're not getting data. What's a 403? Is that a bad response? Oh. Probably more context than that. Forbidden something. Okay. I think I got an idea. Um, so we go to, you know, requests. And one of the things we didn't really provide or look at was headers. Um, and so let's just try passing, passing a header in.
took longer. Oh, look at that. We got a 200. Um, so you, why did we get an unauthorized? I don't have the best detailed explanation. I wanted to show you that because I know, you know, that's, this is what happens when you go to scrape a site. Some, some site may not reject your request and maybe another one is more specific. Um, so whatever it was with IMDB's site, they just, a header needed to be present for you to access the site. So I put a header in and it doesn't really matter what this, this is. We can do Foxtrot example. And then this time maybe we'll check that we're getting the HTML. And cool. We got a, a ton of HTML. That looks great. Um, so now we got HTML. So we want to use soup. So that should be an equal sign. And then sorry, I know this is hard to hard to visualize with me moving so many things around. I'm trying to uh, speed up without taking forever. So let's check this site. We got a bunch of HTML back from it. Oh, neat. There's even stuff that plays in the background. Um, so this is our data. It looks like that we're we're after. I think unless anybody disagrees, I'd say it seems reasonable that we could make a, a movie database if we had like a a name and probably the year uh that, that it was released and maybe some other information about it, like the the rating and uh the time that the movie the duration of the movie. Um so all of that stuff's here. So let's see what we can get. Notice when I, I click directly on this and I inspected and it's highlighting that, you know, this text is within an H3 with a class of IPC dash title dash text. Um, I don't know. If, do I need to blow this up a little bit more to, if you notice this DOM's not as pretty as the, <laughs> as the first example where they just had very clean classes. Um, but we'll still be able to get this, this data, the, um, you know, back to when we were talking about things that are hard to target. Um, there are things that could have you maybe need to log in. There could be things that maybe only render only under certain conditions. So you would need something to make that happen and able to, to get your data. Um, and that is what the Selenium portion of the lecture, you know, alludes to Selenium is an end-to-end -end library that you can use to also make requests, but it can act as a client and it's meant for end-to-end -end testing your application, but it can also go to websites and log in as a user or be a bot and, you know, like, like something many times on your application or handle jobs on your applications, the, the limits kind of what you are able to code. Um, anyways, so if we go, we're going to try and see if we can get this tag. We'll, we'll double check. You probably should, if you're trying to collect a lot of data, um, it's a good idea to see if they actually all have the same class name or same structure, like we were saying before. Um, so these look pretty good. So we're going to just try and copy some of these in to save a little bit of time but we're going to use soup. We're trying to find all the H3 tags that have that class name that we're looking for. So then if we do print titles, okay. I got a bunch of stuff again. Um, seems great. Um, now I guess we could try and clean it up. We could do what we did last time. And maybe, maybe a lot of this is just HTML tags. So we do for title and titles, print title.text. Um, 
Okay, that looks a little bit better. And so we're getting a lot of our data here. And look, actually, it looks like all of our data, but we got some stuff that we don't want. And that's kind of um, the whole deal with scraping. You start with all this HTML that you don't want. There's some stuff in it that you do want. And you continuously filter down until you have what you were looking for. And then you extract it and keep it. And then it's yours forever. That's the... That's the plus side. Um, so if we look at this, what would we do to, what's a good way? How do we get just our data? We don't really want um, IMDB charts or um, whatever all this other junk is, but it looks like we got 250 movies and all the titles. So like, we don't want to throw all that away. What, what options do we have? We're in Python now, which is, that's the, the the great thing about this is there's lots of answers when when I was talking about whether you know what efficient approach you would want to do just think about solving it first don't worry about um well it, I shouldn't do nested for loops you triple nest your loops if you need to if it gets the data and then figure out how to not do you know triple nested loops but um anyone have any thoughts you could potentially do uh, regex matching against those numbers. You could. You could potentially do that. Um, I'm going to paste in a solution that I used for it, and we'll talk about it a little bit, but just because there's a decent amount. Um, so my thoughts were, you know, if we split on the text, that actually the only entries we're looking for have, it looks like this, you know, this one dot, two dot, I guess that is, you know, how IMDB ranks them. So if I decide, I guess um, in my example, I did decide I, I'm going to keep the IMDB ranks. So I just want the entries that can be broken into a list of at least two items uh, with the first one being the rank and the second one being the title. Um, and it's inside a try where if it fails, we just continue. Um, so whenever we can't, you know, find two items to split on, um, or a period, then we just ignore it. Um, let's see if this works. Cause I'm really just copy, copy paste in some code. And I'm hoping that the live demo doesn't just blow up, but I'm sure it will. Wow, awesome. Lots of data again. Um, okay, so that was that gets to another thing with, with scraping is why we're going to talk about pandas and Jupyter at all. Um, as you can tell, when I run these commands, you know, my my terminal is like blowing up. There's all this HTML, all this, all these gigantic lists. Like, how do I know that the middle of this list doesn't have, you know, 10 of the same name in a row, you know? And especially as I you know, collect larger and larger amounts of data. That's something that you have to think about when you set up a script to scrape is just because you can grab 1 million objects of, you know, or, or whatever it is for, for your lists. Um, do you actually want to do that? Is it going to be easier to check or will that be a nightmare to try and verify? And so some of it is about keeping a balance of, of what you or your team can actually keep up with. Um, so we're going to install pandas right now. Install pandas. And we might as well just go ahead and install Jupyter because um, we're going to use them a little bit together and you'll see why here in a second. Jupyter kind of takes a, a little bit. That was mine's cache, so if yours takes a, a little while, um, don't worry. It, it does install a decent amount of stuff, but um, it seems pretty useful. So now that we've got Jupyter installed, let's see. We need to install pandas so that we can now write to a data frame. So has anybody used pandas? Do we... Do we know what convenience pandas offers us um, in this situation?
it basically just helps you work with tabular data, right? Yeah, essentially. Um, but and so what I'm what I'm doing down here is I'm making a data frame that I'm calling ranks. And to do that, I imported pandas as PD. That just seems to be the convention. That's how they say to do it in the doc. So that's why I, I do it like that. Um, but you know, so PD is what you'll use to access a lot of your pandas things. So if you do PD dot data frame, we can actually take that list we were printing and we can just say rank and then uh what was it called ranks and then now we've made a data frame for ranks and then we could do um if movie titles and then it should be just title Oops. So now that we have these two data frames here, we now can do stuff like uh, DF ranks is the first one we'll do, but we can just do um, dot two CSV and then that this is really just a convenience thing because can you write a CSV in Python? Um, yes, you've all done it. Um, this is just a little bit shorter syntax. I'm not having to write, uh, you know, a few other lines and declare headers and stuff like that. Oh, it needs to be movie titles. Okay. And so if we clear this and then run, I would expect, oh, well, I just installed Jupyter twice. Whoops. I would expect this to generate, yeah, two CSVs. So we now have rank. Okay, and then we also have title, and it looks like we've got everything um, in our CSV, and they both have one of the one of the reasons I like uh, splitting this up is we're going to eventually combine these when we make our our database, and so or our our API database. Uh, I shouldn't be saying them interchangeably, but the data we're collecting, we can put in our database and then serve from our backend as an API, if that makes sense. Um, so now that we have these CSVs in here, um, the reason we installed Jupyter, geez, sorry, I can't type, the, the Y and the I always gets me pretty bad. <laughs> oh, there's no dash. Weird. Okay. I got to pull that over. So what I just ran was Jupyter Notebook, and that's going to run. Um, sorry, let me. Get this organized here. Okay, so when we come over to this, we can select Python three. And um, here we're going to be able to interact with our pandas data frames. Um, so one of the things that we can do is import pandas as PD. And then inside Jupyter, these are cells. So you can run them by pressing shift enter, but they are, you know, kind of like running a Python script, except you get to see the, um, the last things that were run and you can reset cells. And similar, I included docs for this in the in the repo. Um, but 
uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot to these, these libraries that you could do besides just scraping. Um, so what I'm going to do here is just LS. I just want to check and see where our CSVs are. And so now that we have, um, this, we should be able to create a data frame almost the same way where we just say DF titles is equal to, and then we would just do PD dot read CSV because we want to build it from the titles dot CSV that we have above us. And then if we go ahead and just do DF titles right now. Uh, now we can see our CSV and it's a little bit prettier. One thing you'll notice is we've got to change some options if we want to see everything. So something you can do is PD set option and it's uh, display dot max rows and then none. And then now we should be able to run this again and then we would expect to see, oh, I think it's just my scroller. There we go. But now we can scroll through all of our data, right? Um, and now, um, so we can get our other data frame. So if we just LS, because so, I keep forgetting what I named things, and we would just do DF ranks is equal to pd.readcsv. And it would be ranks.csv. And so now we have our ranks and our titles. And then, you know, this is also part of why I like this is it, it makes it easy to scroll through and check your data. Um, you can do this while you're seeing if it's right. You can continue to edit it. Um, maybe something you're doing is really hard. So you actually, just want to check, you know, a portion of it and come back to it later. Um, and so it, it makes it possible to really kind of like take breaks. Um, so another thing that we can do here is we have these two tables and they're, um, we checked in the CSVs that they're the same length. They both have 250 items. Um, so another easy thing that we can do inside pandas or in Jupyter is uh we can do df ranks titles is equal to pd dot read csv oh sorry that is not at all what we're trying to do we are doing pd dot concat for we are concatenating these tables and so we want to take our df ranks and our df titles and when we provide axis equals one, we're telling it to go uh, horizontal. Let's see if that worked. DF ranks titles. Okay. And so now we've got, you know, the rank and title of all these movies, you know, that we just got off the, the web page, which I know seems a little silly, but um, yeah, we're, slowly but surely building a, a database. Um, and it's like, so now we can do DF ranks titles because the data looked good. Um, that two CSV, and we can just call this movie db.csv and then run that. And then we should actually be done in you know Jupyter for now. And so we can, we can just close this out um, if I go back to my VS code, um, we should see, yeah, we've got, um, just the rank and title and our CSV data. Um, all right. How are we doing on time, Julius? <laughs> As, uh, the only reason I ask is I, I kind of want to know if people would like to potentially take a break and then I can, ten can continue with going or if we want to just keep pushing um it's more how people are feeling yeah let's take a vote
wants All right, to. I will go for the push if nobody <laughs> if nobody has anything. Um have I lost anyone yet? Did any has anybody learned anything? Uh, so far, I'm trying to follow along. Um, can I see the uh, top part of your main.py? Just to kind of look at that, because mine's not pulling any any data, actually. So I just, I just wanted to kind of see. Nope. No problem. Compare what do, I did do you need to me to blow it up? Uh, no. Or, yeah. Yeah. Do you have, so you checked the the URL and then the headers was one thing that we had to fix. Um, yeah, or the at least headers, I think is where I had to fix. Okay. So let me, I'll see that. So just like I was saying before, we we really could, um delete you know some of this and then now that we have this other csv with our data we don't we don't really need those and if we do need them we could just scrape them again or or regenerate them again but we have you know the start of a of a database here um now if we go and see let's see how can we get this data well uh oh, that doesn't look as nice. It's like we've got a span, um, another span. Okay. And so it looks like we get some div that has these spans in it, and that has most of our information. Um, not really the best identifying tags. Um, anyone got any thoughts? I ended up doing something that only works pretty well. So it, uh, it actually had to be modified anyways. I think, um, a lot of it is I didn't, I didn't really want to spend the time to make it perfect. Um, it's like, if you figure out that your, your script gets 98% of things, um, sometimes it would just be easier to fix, you know, 2% of something for right now and, um, and not really worry about the the fact that it's not 100% accurate, like the time spent making it 100% accurate um, won't be worth the 2%, if that makes sense. But part of that too is, you know, why I, I showed the pandas um, visualization with the CSV is I feel like um, you're able to correct some things in your CSV where if you're looking at those tables and it turns out that there's actually one extra movie that needs to be added or, or something like that. It's very easy for you to interact with that and then check it um, and combine them. So we're going to kind of rinse and repeat with what we did. The I don't want to get too hung up on, um, you know, how you can write loops and um, scraping. Um, but the idea here is we... These are the things that we want to keep in our database. So ranks, movie titles, uh, the release years, the movie length, and the ratings. Um, and this is the same thing that we were using to scrape the titles before. It's just we're basically doing more work inside of, of the loop. So um, if we look at it, what's going on here is we're we're trying to target this H3 tag. And so we have this H3 tag, but we also want these span tags down here and they don't have that many great things to identify them. So while we're iterating, um, we actually just ask title for the next div. And so the next div from title, if we go down and it's like, here we are. So it's the next div and now we have all three of the spans that are inside of there. Um, and this is what I was talking about where when you find something like that, you hope that that pattern persists across all of the pages or at least as far as all of the data that you're trying to collect. So you 
you're going to change maybe your approach based on how things are structured or the patterns that you can find. Um, and so, um, once we find that next div, we just ask for all the spans. And then again, we're doing some, some fancy stuff. I bet, I bet someone could come up with a, you know, what conditional I missed. Um, but let's just go ahead and run the code and see what we get and see. So I think I can, the new things that we're trying to get, we already have titles and all of that. So I guess we're interested in seeing if we can get the release years. Oh yeah, I mentioned, so I just had to press control C to stop the Jupyter server. Um, it'll make you, it'll basically ask you if you're sure that you want to close it you can just hit yes. I ha we'll, we'll be firing it up here in a second soon. So, um, it shouldn't interrupt with, you know, or interfere with anything. Uh, let's see. So again, we checked and just tons of data, pretty hard to tell um, whether or not that that worked out the way that we wanted to. And so if we, you know, follow the same kind of pattern that we did before, we can make some data frames and then these data frames can just write our data to a CSV. And look at this, we have some, some CSVs here and we look, um, that one's got 250 entries. That's, that's pretty good. Um, this one also has 250 entries. Um, and then, uh, oh, this one does not have 250 entries. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna cheat though, um, just to save us some time. But I will go over it in a second. Let's see. We can just say that those ratings are equal to these. Ratings. Okay. So I, I did that to just go ahead and check, but so that was the convenience of having the columns or having them directly as CSVs is just by, I didn't even really have to look at the data. I just had to skim over it. I can tell most of it looks appropriate or, or not appropriate. Um, but then I can easily see whether we got the right amount of entries or not, because it's important that, you know, all of the fields are filled out. Um, and so in our case, it wasn't, um, I can tell you, I, the, the list that I paste, I think is, is correct. I really didn't spend too much time, um, trying to verify, but the issue that we have is there are some, I believe it is right around Wally. -E. So there's a movie like this, um, number 58, the 12th fail doesn't seem to have a, um rating and so it didn't cause an error it didn't break anything but that column is you know shorter than the rest of the columns and so we need to figure out how to get it in there um i think that could be handled when you're looping i, I think if i spent more time on um you know if we go back to the main.py there there's probably some logic that can be done in here to make sure that when you actually don't have something there you put you put something there um but we'll leave that for now i want to just get towards at least generating the um fixture so we copied all this stuff we have our csvs um so this stuff we we're really just using this to quickly generate a csv and then go back into jupyter notebook and again like if you just don't like Jupyter Notebook or you feel fine, you're not, not using it. I'm not trying to force it on you. It's 
Um, the, the good convenience that I like about it is when you have these past queries or other things that you've been searching for, um, you've got like a really nice, pretty history, essentially. Um, so what's the next thing that we want to do? Um, I guess we want to read in our movie database real quick and actually I'm just going to kill this cell then ls okay and then we'll do pf movie pd dot read csv and then it would be b movie db dot csv Ooh. let's see I wonder if I have to sometimes you can um, run into some issues and the an easy way to fix it is to just restart and run all cells and it will basically run through from the top Ooh, titles oh because I deleted this okay told you guys we would have some stuff blow up what is this All right, maybe it's maybe it would have been easier to just actually open up a fresh one, but let's see. Almost there. Okay, that's what we expected to see. And then now we want to take our release years. Um see so yeah we want to make data frames of our release years our movie lengths and our movie ratings and then um read them read from the csvs that we got and then sorry there we go So I just ran that quickly, which that's a good thing that it didn't blow up. Um, so we read these data frames in, they're the same length now. And then what we're doing here is we're basically concatenating the, the same rows, um, or not the same, but the new CSVs that we just made. And so now we have a CSV with a rank, a title, a year, a length, and a rating um and then so just like we did before um now we just want to re-update that so we'll write it back and update it and it'll be waiting for us in our code so now we're completely done with jupiter and we can check our movie database Ooh, I think I must have not finished typing, but lucky for us, it just needs the extension, but I missed that somehow. Ooh, all right. So now that we got all that out of the way, we we technically don't need you know any of any of this stuff now. We're we're now trying. We we have this CSV. Well, we'll leave the imports. Okay. Um, 
and we still have pandas. So pandas will, will be helpful for that for us is just like we manipulated these CSVs. Um, we don't need these anymore. Uh, we'll be able to read in, you know, our movie database CSV and store it into a, a, a data frame in our code as well. And so that's what we'll do starting off is we'll read from the CSV and then um, we're going to make an empty list called fixtures. And you start with a PK of one and then you can basically begin some form of looping. Um, with pandas, we're going to be using the iter rows and it's just helping us put go through the columns row by row, um, essentially. And uh, so for each fixture we're adding, um, the important part, I, I know I talked for the uh, extra lecture I did last time with fixtures. Um, it's the app name and then the model uh, that, you know, is going to have whatever these fields are. So, you know, this would be the movies app that has a movie model and, you know, you'll be able to load all these movies into your Django app um, in like a, a very fast amount of time. But um, so, yeah, does anyone have any questions? There's one thing you can see it. We have to import JSON because the, the end result is we, a, a fixture will be a JSON um, object that we just put inside of a fixtures folder in Django and tell it about after we migrate. So I'll just import JSON real quick. And press control C. And so we got this JSON object here. And you know, this contains, you know, all of the the movies for you know, that we just scraped in our little lesson. Um, and so I know this is like pretty, pretty simple, um, but using this, you can load all this into your database. If you didn't see the video, it's also in the, um, in the repo um, extra links. So uh, I think it's actually down in one of the hints. So yeah, if you're at the point where you followed all of this and um, you now have a fixture and you don't know what to do with it, watch that video because that'll, that'll show you how to make an API with that fixture basically, or at least that gets started off by that fixture. Um, I did want to show real quick, I guess, let me just deactivate this. Um, and just close out of this for a sec. Let's see. So this is an older script that I was messing with for an API that I just built, but it, I feel like helps visualize some of, you know, the web crawling or, um, scraping, so to speak. So let me close this real quick and open this. Okay. Oh, lost my VS code. There we go. Okay, so I mentioned Selenium earlier that this is part of why we're not gonna get it, dive into all of it, you know, at once. It was already a lot kind of just going through the general, you know, rotation, but I want to remind you guys between both videos, you, you have like finding data on some site somewhere and then transporting that data getting it to your local machine, finding a way to get it from your local machine into a database. Um, so of the hundreds of different ways to, to do that, you don't feel like you're forced to use what I'm showing you. It's just, I think, helpful to see something if you're, um, yeah, if you haven't seen these things before. Um, but Selenium, I mentioned earlier, will help for interacting and testing um, so if you need Selenium to act on your behalf, essentially, or act as a bot or act as 
another worker. Um, those are, those are good use cases for it. Um, these, you know, these scripts, they start off like you saw the last one and, uh, this one, even, you know, if I LS, we're, we're just inside a folder and there's a, a main Python file and there's, there's nothing, this isn't Django or flask or anything. It's just Python. Um, and so there's a lot that you could do with that because it, you could put it in Django or flask or, uh, that there's nothing stopping you, but you also can just use it in, in Python as well. Um, we're not going to really use too much of it, but the, it, when I run this script, you'll see Selenium basically doing what we're doing with requests. So every time you see a browser opening, it'll basically be the same as, uh, if we had made that request, we just usually don't get to see it. Um, and so I've got, you know, this is an API that I recently built. And if we go to this website, it's a popular you know, rock climbing website. And it's like similar idea that I knew there was some data on this website that, um, I was interested in, you know, scraping and it's like, you know, I actually, th these were in my backyard. These apartments are real apartments in town. And, um, you know, I, I lived here like a year ago. So I was like, Oh, well, why don't I scrape and see if I can get all the boulders of people that climbed and, you know, practically my backyard. Um, so I, I already know that the part that I'm looking for and the pattern that I have set up to match my functions is this apartment dash boulders string. And so similarly, if I, if I run this, oh, probably not that we should see Selenium actually open a browser for me and then it'll go to that page and then the next, and then the next, and it'll work its way through all of the pages. Um, and so you don't need Selenium to do this, that Selenium helps for visualizing this um, because, you know, that first exercise where I asked, you know, what author has, you know, the most quotes from the first 10 pages, um, you know, if you wrote a while loop that iterated, you know, 10 or 11 times and, you know, grabbed all the pages and then you figured out a way to separate the data, you could figure out, you know, just probably the length of, of entries or something like that. Um, got where I was going with that, but do I have any questions that, um, what do you guys think? Uh, I guess we can. I mean, similar idea, but, you know, now all these boulders have been added to my list. Um, and so this is ongoing and I could, uh, you know, update it or edit it with pandas more. Um, but um, again, as far as like the documentation, there's a, a good amount of, of links just to, you could probably spend a month or two in pandas or Jupiter. I don't know if that's the best move as a software engineer, but if you're more data engineer and like, you know, excited and are considering that kind of stuff, I think that's why it's helpful to look at some of these libraries and what you can do with them um, for your personal and your group projects. Um, but yeah. If you guys don't have anything for me, that's all I got for you. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. It's good stuff. No problem. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Awesome stuff.